On today's video, we are doing a master class in all things first time home buyers. The process, the timelines, FAQs, everything. Stick around. How's it going, y'all? My name is Jesse Lynch, and this YouTube channel is devoted to two things. The first of which is teaching people about buying, selling, investing in real estate, and the second of which is showing off the amazing place that I live, the Twin Cities of Minnesota. If either of those two things appeal to you, then right now, do us both a favor, subscribe to the channel, click the little bell to get notified, give the video a thumbs up, and say what's up in the comments. I really do appreciate the comments. Like I said at the beginning, today's video is basically a master class on all things first time home buyer. If there's any video of mine that you watch before you reach out to me, this is probably the best one that I have out so far. The most complete, the most thorough, and, and by the end of it, you should be more fluent and you'll be able to be more effective when you're trying to buy your first home. So, all right, this video I think is already gonna be really long, so let's dive into it. And in this video, the whole time, this is my process. I'm gonna assume that you are reaching out to me. For one, you're watching my video, and two, I have this process down really well. I don't know why you would reach out to anybody else, but if you do, I hope they're good to you. Okay, so these first three steps, they sometimes will happen in different orders. I'm going to assume that you're watching this video, you're already thinking about buying your first home, and you think, I gotta call that guy which by the way you should, I promise we will crush it. Okay, so step one is that you contact me. And if you watch my other videos, you probably know that I always say call, text, email, leave me a message on my website, DM me on Instagram, DM me on Facebook. But I also even have people who reach out to me through like my Google listing, which is cool. My fear is always that it's gonna be harder for me to see, or I'm not gonna notice that somebody was reaching out to me. So if I had my way, it would probably be two things. It would be my website, tothetwincities.com, or my website, jessielandrealty.com, and then call, text, and email. So anyways, the first step is that you contact me. If you're wondering when you should contact me, I have a video called The Home Buying Timeline, and I would say go watch that. But more or less, I would say as short as like two months uh, before you want to actually be moving, um, and then maybe as far as like six months in advance. But that being said, if you know that your credit is maybe iffy, then earlier is better, a year out. That's cool because then you can actually get like a roadmap to where you have to be to buy the house. But if you don't ever reach out, then you might just constantly be in this purgatory where your credit isn't quite good enough, but you wanna buy a house. And I don't want that for you. It depends on if you're from here, if you're from out of state, if you're adverse to like a Zoom call or like a video chat, or if you're also adverse to meeting in person, whatever, we can accommodate, but that is the next step, right? Is that we set up a time to talk whether that be in person or digitally, or even just on the phone. Okay, and then, you know, whatever, we'll, we'll talk back and forth, we'll figure out when it works. So then we'll talk back and forth, we'll figure out a time, and then we will actually have that meeting. And in that meeting, typically, they're usually about an hour long, sometimes like an hour and a half, sometimes even a little bit longer, that kind of depends on my schedule and your schedule, and also just how prepared you are. And in that Zoom call, for one, we kind of go over what I'm talking about today, but more specifically, you know, you come to the table with some questions and uh, concerns that you might have, and then hopefully I can answer them. And then we can begin to talk about how these next steps go, and then we basically begin to implement them. Which brings me to the second step, which is that you get pre-approved by a mortgage lender. So a quick couple frequently asked questions on this one. The first one is, how much money do I need for down payment? This varies quite a bit depending on your circumstance, but I would say one good video to watch of mine is called, how much does it cost to buy a home in Minnesota? But I would say it's good to at least have $2,000, maybe even $2,500 for inspection. And then if you wanna do like fancier versions of the inspection with a sewer scope and radon. And then there's also appraisal, which a lot of the time, you know, you're gonna have to pay for upfront. Sometimes it gets refunded as a closing cost. That's a whole other story. But, but anyways, I would say on the low end, if you can have $2,000 to $2,500 saved up, then you can potentially qualify for down payment assistance. And that's as little as you need. If you're not going to use down payment assistance and maybe you want to use like an FHA loan or even like a 3% down conventional loan, then approximately 3% of the total price of houses that you're looking at. So if you're looking at a $300,000 house, then probably as low as $9,000. But then again, I would probably also have an extra thousand to fifteen hundred dollars saved for uh, inspection and appraisal. Okay, and then second is what are closing costs? Um, so closing costs are like a sort of a, a thing that people kind of underestimate. They're not thinking about ahead of time. 
but closing costs typically end up being around 3% of the total purchase price of a home. Again, so let's use that $300,000 mark. So for a $300,000 home, uh, closing costs would be around 9,000. But I wanna be clear, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have that money available to you, right? You don't necessarily need, you know, 3% saved up for down payment and 3% for closing costs. There are ways that we can wrap that into the mortgage. Sometimes it does make your offer look less appealing, but again, getting these closing costs covered by the seller is definitely doable. It definitely doesn't have to come out of your pocket we just have to do a great job of structuring your offer well for other reasons. So in regards to a lender, if you have a lender that you know personally, or maybe your parents have used or whatever, and you want to use them, cool. One thing that I would personally recommend is to generally avoid the big banks. I'm not going to name any names, but think of a big national bank. And generally, I think it's probably a good idea to avoid working with them. And the reason for that is because good communication is truly like the single most important quality that a lender can have. Sure, the big banks have money and can give it to you to buy a house, but are you going to feel like you're totally in the dark throughout the process? That's entirely possible. I've worked twice now with a really big bank who I won't name. And, and it really was a nightmare. Not, not only for me, like it, it was, it sucked for me, but it really sucked for the people who are trying to buy the house. They just felt like they were in the dark all the time. Even days before closing, they had this like, are we gonna get this house feeling? That's a terrible place to be. You don't wanna be in that situation. And so because of that, I really recommend avoiding the big banks. But okay, let's say you talk to me and you, and you, you like the idea of using my favorite lender. He's really incredible, by the way. Everybody who I send him to says, thank you for recommending this lender to me. But so the way I like to do it, I like to send an email out to both you and the lender connecting you. And I basically just say, hey, I wanna connect y'all. And then from that point, sort of the lender takes the reins for a little bit. And usually he'll introduce himself and he'll ask you to either like prepare or also potentially upload five different documents. Either get them ready and then you have a meeting with him or you just upload them to their secure server and then he can sort of look at them. And then by the time he's talking to you, it's basically he's saying, yeah, you're good to go, or maybe he has some other questions. So again, there's kind of a couple ways you can do it. Either you set up a, you know, a Zoom call, a phone call, or you meet in person and you provide the documents then, or you upload all the documents, he looks at them, and then you figure out another time to talk. And then at that point, he'll have a more thorough understanding of your financial situation, and he'll be able to provide you a pre-approval. So the five documents that he's gonna ask for. The first one is the previous two years tax returns. So so 1040 or 1040 easy, whatever. Or if you're self-employed, he'll need like all schedules, businesses, and K-1s. The second is the previous two years W-2s, or again, if you're self-employed, 1099s. The third is your three most recent pay stubs. And as the process goes along, as you, you know, when you have something under contract, he'll, they'll continue to ask for your most recent pay stubs just to make sure you're still employed, et cetera. The fourth one is the two most recent months of your bank statements or your like asset statements. So like a bank account, 401k, whatever other like stock things that you have. And also they say they want all of the pages of those things, even if one of them is blank. And then the fifth thing is a copy of your driver's license. And then boom, just like that, you're pre-approved. It's magic. It's not magic. I actually don't know exactly how everything works, but my lender does. I'm not a lender, I'm a real estate agent. And my lender is not just a lender, I think he's a wizard. Okay, and then once you have your pre-approval, then we move on to the MLS search. And now the MLS search often uh, coincides with actually step number one, right? That first meeting. A lot of times we'll say, you know, do you have an idea of what you want to afford? And they'll say, yep, I, you know, up to 300,000, cool. And then, and then we kind of dig into criteria. So bedrooms, you know, you want two plus bedroom, three plus bedroom, bathroom, are you okay with just one? Do you want two, three? 14, you know, it's up to you. And then how many garage stalls, you know, do you have like a minimum maximum square footage? And then also most importantly, usually is location, right? And we can get very specific with location. We can draw a map. Say you're like, I only want anything east of 35W and west of 35E. Cool, we can do it, totally doable. Um, and you just kind of draw the line. Um, or you can say, uh, I don't really care where it is, but I want it to be five miles from my work. Cool, boom, five miles, drag a little radius, 
perfect. So we can set up the frequency of emails you get. If you're not looking super aggressively, then we can say maybe once a week or twice a week or even once a month. Or if you know maybe you're, you're, you're two months out from where you're actually gonna be looking and you're like, I just like one email a day. Cool, we can do that too. But when it gets real, right? Once you're like actually looking, then, then really what you're gonna want is to get those emails the moment a home hits the market and then boom, it's sent to your email. And then you know, okay, something within my criteria is on the market, let's, let's see what it looks like. If you like it, cool. Also side note, if you like it, cool. And then that brings us to the next step. But actually before that, uh, side note, if you don't know where it is you want to live in the Twin Cities, may I recommend this channel. Okay, we do virtual tours of tons of neighborhoods in the Twin Cities, and I literally am just gonna keep pumping them out. So if you're trying to figure that out, there is not a better place anywhere on the internet to find that information. So subscribe to the channel and click the bell to get notified. All right, enough of that. So you get a home email to you, or you use the HomeSpotter app, which I will also give to you, link in the description if you're interested. And you find some house that you find very compelling, and it's active, okay, not contingent, not pending, basically, those are more or less sold, okay? So we're not looking at those, active or coming soon, okay? But then you're like, well, how do I go see it? Really easy, all you do is you text me a link or an address or an MLS number and you say, hey, can we go see this one? Yep, we can. And sometimes, right when people are pre-approved or when, once they're officially kind of in that timeline where it makes sense to start looking offers, I'll say, why don't we go look at like, four to eight houses in a day, and we'll just hammer through a bunch of houses that you find even remotely compelling. Even if you're like 50-50, you know, you're pretty sure, you're like, eh, I don't think this is gonna work, but let's go look at it just in case. I tend to think it's a good idea to go look at it. It makes you feel a little more educated, and you also, you know, some of like the, ooh, like this is so exciting, every house is great thing starts to wear off and you can begin to have a little bit more of a discerning eye. But that being said, I'm also very aware of like the honeymoon stage uh, in the home buying process. And I try to be very diligent to point out flaws in a home that I want you to be aware of. I really want you to know, okay, there's you know five things about this house that aren't perfect, but I still think with all those things included, I'm interested enough to put an offer in on it which I'll get to next. But first, a couple FAQs for the showing process. The first one really is how does it work, which is basically you see a house you like, you send it to us, we say, cool, does this time work? And then you say, yeah, and then we go, cool, we'll see you there. Pretty simple and it literally just doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. The second FAQ is what if I'm out of state? Okay, what if I literally can't physically go? Or what if I'm working, you know? I really like this house, but I'm working like all day today you know, which then I would say, we can do virtual tours. You're talking to the virtual tour people and we do not only virtual tours of entire neighborhoods, but we also do virtual tour of houses. We can do like a Zoom call, right? Where you're actually on the other line or I can record a video and, and I just walk through, I do my best to show you, here's what the space like, here's how it flows. And then I point out any flaws that I see. And I kind of think that this is a really effective way of doing it for people who are like interested. I think I can get people sort of like, you know, 80 or 90% the way there in their head just by looking at it on video and me talking through it. And then some people are willing to make an offer just based on that video and my assessment of it. But other people are like, wow, that looks really cool. I, now I would like to make very sure that I can go see this house as soon as I possibly can. And sometimes that means I do a showing at like 10 a.m., right, when it's all bright out, but then we have to set another showing for like 8 p.m. It's dark, but at least they can go and be in it. You know, it's one thing to see a place, but it's another thing to feel a place. So I totally understand wanting to just be in the space. And the last FAQ is how long do people typically look? And it's a huge range, literally as few as one house, and then they really love it, they put an offer in on it, they get it, and eventually they own it. But typically I would say like 15 to 20. And I sort of think that a person's like ability to window shop and visualize a place based on photos kind of determines how quickly they're going to be able, to some degree determines how quickly they're gonna be able to find a place that they really like. Okay, so then the next step is you find a place you really like, okay? So now what, how do, you, how do you get it? Okay, that's basically like the offer writing stage is actually very, very simple. I try my best to make it really simple. 
I also have people who help me draft up offers. So even if we think that an offer is like, uh, maybe not that competitive, I'm still a pretty big advocate for saying, let's write up the offer that you want to present and submit it. Worst case scenario is they just don't accept it. And best case scenario is they do. What I really want to avoid is not making an offer because we think it's gonna sell for more than you care to pay for it, and then finding out that it actually went for less than you would have paid for it. That is definitely something that uh, I don't need to have to deal with. Okay, so when you say, okay, I really like this, now I, I'd like to try to buy it, then there are a few main aspects of the purchase agreement that we're gonna have to talk about, right? We're gonna have to go, okay, what do you wanna do for the following things? The first one is obviously the big one. How much are you willing to pay for this house, right? And I have some theories for how to kind of determine what a house is actually gonna go for. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about it here. It's a little bit chewy, a little bit hard to get through. So purchase price, uh, the next one is earnest money. Earnest money is fundamentally a gesture of good faith. You're putting money down. Basically what you're saying is, here you go seller, I'm gonna, put, I'm gonna give you this you know, X amount of dollars and you get to hold on to it. And if for any reason I back out of this offer that isn't laid out in the purchase agreement, okay, that isn't a contingency that we've agreed upon previously, then you get to keep that money. And that dollar amount varies. I've seen as little as like 500, 1,000 is a pretty common number in a not too hot of a market. One or 2% of the total purchase price is fairly common in a hot market, okay? so. You can rewind that and listen to all those again, and then you can think about it based on the price that you're looking for. Okay, and the next thing is closing date. When are you gonna close? Typically, 30 days to 60 days is kind of that sweet spot, especially if you're using financing. If you're paying all cash, it could go earlier, um, but also if it's a weird circumstance, maybe the house is totally full of stuff, then potentially it could go uh, a little bit longer, but 30 to 60 days really is that sweet spot. Okay, and then the next thing I'll have to know, which maybe I already know, if you're using my lender, there's a good chance that I kind of already know what you're dealing with, and that is the type of financing. So is it a conventional loan, an FHA loan, USDA loan, or VA loan? And then is it 3%, 3.5%, 5%, are you using MHFA as a down payment? All that stuff. But if you're using my lender, then I should know that stuff anyways. Okay, and then the last two things are basically what they call contingencies. The most common contingency that I work with is an inspection contingency. Uh, most people would say, don't ever buy a house without an inspection contingency. I know some people who have the audacity to do it. Now, I tend to think like, okay, imagine like a contractor. They're gonna have a really good idea of what's going on in a house without having an inspector check on it. If they build houses or if they remodel houses, they can look very discerning and understand what's happening in a house. And so maybe they're willing to buy something without a contingency. Or also think about like an investor who is, you know, buying kind of a rundown house and they're basically gonna gut the whole thing anyways and flip it. They don't necessarily care if uh, the electrical works or if the plumbing is done correctly because they might just gut the whole thing anyways. So, but so let's assume you are using an inspection contingency. The next kind of thing that we wanna know is, well, how long of that inspection contingency period are we doing? Kind of in the, Back in the day, 10 days was the most common, but nowadays people are getting more and more competitive. I think, I think a really competitive number is five days, and, and that's usually just barely enough time to really pull it off, and sometimes you end up extending the inspection contingency a little bit after that, but it does help make an offer look really competitive, like, hey, we're not just gonna like sit on this, like basically just saying, we're not gonna waste your time to deal with stuff that comes up on inspection, okay? We're gonna order inspection right away, and then once we get the results, once we have a walkthrough, then we're gonna discuss these things right away as well. Okay, and then there are other contingencies which typically I'm gonna know about. By the time we're making an offer, I'm gonna know, oh, you have a house that you're trying to sell, um, and so we have to make the purchase of this house contingent on the sale of that house, okay? Um, I should know those things, otherwise we're just kind of like, well, oh, flying by the seat of our pants, right? And that's not how I prefer to do things in the real estate world. Okay, two FAQs that they're not really frequently asked questions, but they're more like frequently uh, things that I tell people. Uh, it's not a thing, F-T-I-T-P. Okay, F-T-I-T-Ps. 
Number one is there's a thing called an escalation clause. And the easiest way that I can explain an escalation clause is like on eBay, there's a max bid amount. Apologies if you don't know what that is, but basically if there's something on eBay that's $200, but you're willing to pay up to $250, but you don't necessarily want to pay $250 right away if, if the next highest offer is still only 200. So you'll set your max bid for $250. And, and if the, and if truly the highest bid currently is only 200, then maybe you'll go to $205, but then somebody else can come up and they'll say, well, I'll pay 210, but then you'll beat it by two, but then you'll beat it at 215. And then they say, oh shoot. Okay. How about 230? Nope. You'll still beat it at 235. So you can escalate above any other net offer by a predetermined amount and then you can cap it at a certain amount. And now there are some pros and cons to that. Some listing agents just are adverse to those things. They don't like them. They think they're funny business. And then other agents think they're great and they probably use them all the time. But really the beauty of it is that it protects you from overpaying over somebody else by a ton of money. Maybe you're just fine paying 250 for something, but if you don't have to, if the next highest offer is only 220, well then maybe paying 225 is a lot better than that. I would think so, right? Okay, if, if you don't understand that, I apologize. Maybe rewind it and play it again, or maybe just hit me up and I will go into further detail about it. I could probably make a whole video about that, but I'm not going to right now. Okay, and then the other thing that people, the other FTI, TP, is basically a thing called an appraisal guarantee. An appraisal guarantee is basically saying like, when the bank hires an appraiser to come out and tell the bank, how much is this house worth? Or is this house worth what they're lending on it? Let's say, let's use that same number, 250. But the appraiser comes out and says, I appraise this house at a value of $240,000. And an appraisal guarantee, basically as a buyer, you would be saying, I'm willing to cover the difference that the home doesn't appraise for in cash up to a price of $10,000, right? So in that situation, then the $10,000, then you would just have to come up with in cash. Okay, do I really recommend that for first time home buyers? Not really. Uh, if you have a bunch of cash and you just love, love, love the house, then sure, and you think you're gonna live there for a long time, sure, do it. Then to some degree, I think you're just sort of paying for these cosmetic updates that maybe the lender is like, well, we don't think it's really worth that. Like maybe a lender says, we don't think a four car garage is worth an extra $10,000, but maybe you do. Okay, so we submit an offer and then what happens next? Basically, there are three potential things. They accept the offer, awesome. They reject the offer, flat, just outright, nope, sorry. Or maybe they accept another offer, right? So you just, either you get it, you don't get it, or they counter offer. So basically, maybe they say, we like your offer, but there's a couple little things that we wanna change about it. Or maybe we like your offer, but we would like a higher price whatever. So those are all the things. So either you get it accepted, rejected, or counteroffered. And let's say you get it countered and then we can come to terms and then you have it signed and you have what is called a fully executed purchase agreement. Okay, cool. So then boom, that is when the clock starts for your contingency, right? Like your inspection contingency. Okay, we have a five day inspection contingency window. We better order that inspection right away. Okay, and so usually I order the inspection for you if you wanna use my people and boom, they can get out there in a day or two and do the inspection. And then usually on the day of the inspection, they'll do a walkthrough with us, okay? So the inspector spends like three hours in the house looking at everything, filling up every single sink, letting it run, filling up the bathtubs, letting it run, turning the furnace up, turning the AC on if it's not freezing cold out, turning the oven on, putting a thermometer in the fridge, in the freezer, it's, it's wild, they do a ton. They can also scope the sewer line underneath the house to make sure that there's no roots blocking it or whatever, or that it's not totally crumbled. Okay, so let's say something comes up on the inspection and you wanna get it addressed, that's cool. Then basically we talk through it and hopefully we can all come to terms, right? And so let's say, Let's say you get a radon test and the radon comes back a little bit high. Okay, that's like that's like a health issue. And then very often we're able to get the seller to either install one or provide a credit for it or potentially lower the price. Although I don't think that's very helpful, but that's a whole nother rant that I'm not gonna talk about. 
okay, so we work all the way through inspection. We get them to maybe put in a radon system, whatever it is. And then usually at the bottom of that amendment that you're signing, it says signing of this amendment by both parties will remove the inspection contingency. And then boom, we are through inspection. And then the next hurdle is appraisal. And the appraisal is something that the lender orders. They don't have like a specific relationship with the appraiser. They used to do that back in before 2007, but that's a no-no. They, they really can't do that anymore. So there's sort of like an agency. I don't know if that's really what it's called, but it's like a, a group and they say, hey, we'd like to order an appraisal. And they go, cool. And they randomly, basically the next appraiser in line, boom, comes out to that house on a certain day. Usually the appraisal takes two or three weeks from when it's ordered. So for five days in, and then we get through inspection, boom, they ordered it. Two to three weeks, the appraiser will come out. And then here's another FAQ. Basically, what the appraiser is trying to do is that they know the purchase price of the house, right, that you agreed on. And they wanna come out and they will want to be able to justify, can I justify this purchase price for this home so that the lender isn't lending way too much money on a house that isn't worth this amount? And for the most part in this kind of wild market, I tend to see things appraise at value, but there is a chance that maybe it doesn't appraise quite enough and maybe you don't have the appraisal guarantee. So then another FAQ is, well, what happens then? Basically there are three options here. One is that the seller agrees to just lower the price to that appraisal number, okay? The second is that you agree to come up with the cash to cover the difference. And then the third is sort of a combination of those two things. And actually, while I'm at it, the fourth is that the agents or the lenders can challenge an appraisal and provide comparable homes and try to justify a higher price. Okay, one last FAQ on that. How much is an inspection? Typically $400 to $700, depending on uh, the sort of add-ons that you do. It's like $400 for the base one, maybe like $150 if you want to add a sewer scope, and then another $150 if you want to do a radon test. So then after appraisal, um, basically, at that point, it's very much like being done in the background, right? It's the lenders and the title company. The lenders are looking at your finances and making sure that everything is as it should be and that they are still able to lend to you. There's a lot of like federal guidelines that lenders have to follow and they have to make sure, okay, does this person fit into this box? And they sort of call that underwriting, right? Like they have they have mortgage brokers, but then they have specific underwriting people who are diving deeper into your finances. It's a pretty holistic approach. They're looking at a ton of different stuff, you know, your bank accounts, your debt, your your job, your uh, paychecks, et cetera. They're, they're really looking at a lot of stuff. And they're just making sure, yep, you're all good. And then on the other side of it is the title company. And the title company, basically what their job is, is to make sure that the person selling the house to you is actually the person who owns it, right? And is actually the person who has the right to sell the house to you. And that there are no encumbrances or what they call clouds on title. Basically, they wanna make sure that when you buy this house, you're not gonna have any like legal problems at the end of it. And one thing that basically everybody has to pay for if they're getting financing specifically is called title insurance. And that is part of a closing cost. And basically that's the title company does their absolute best to make sure that there's nothing weird about the title. But in the event that something crazy happens, title insurance should kick in and you shouldn't have to give up the house or whatever and you certainly shouldn't have to pay anything for it, right? And so that title insurance says that if anything crazy comes up, you still own the house, but we are going to sort of uh, make it right with whoever has like the rightful ownership of the house. Okay, and then basically the last thing, the last step in the whole thing is final walkthrough, which usually is on the same day as closing day. Okay, sometimes we'll do it the night before, but very often we'll just do it, you know, one hour before close, We'll go to the house and we'll look at it. Just basically we're making sure that it's still there, that it is as we thought it would be, that they removed all their furniture, that they didn't put any holes in the wall, that they didn't take all the appliances, that they didn't gut all the electrical, right? That just, when you go to close, you're assured that, okay, this house is still the same house as the one that I saw in that showing. And then we actually go, usually it's to the title company and we have a closing. 
Closing usually takes like about an hour. You sign like a, like a Moby Dick stack of papers and you know, but the closer who's like a person at the title company, they do it all the time. And so you don't have to like read through everything. They go sign here, date here. Here's what this thing is. Sign here, date here. Now here's what this one is. Sign here, date here. Okay, and they're very efficient. And even though you're signing like a massive novel worth of papers, it actually doesn't take that long. Typically somewhere around an hour. And then officially, once you're all signed, they send the papers and the down payment money over. Officially at that point, you get the keys and you are now a homeowner. Okay, this took me a very, very long time to shoot. I am uh, approximately an hour late for a meeting with my team members, Alex and Nick, to whom I'm very sorry, but these videos are important. They know that, I know that. So, all right, thank you for watching this. I really hope this was helpful. I think this is gonna be the video that I show basically every new client. Like, hey, before you do anything, I'd like you to watch this video and you'll be way more fluent in the whole process. And I hope that that helps for you as well. And I hope that I can help you as well. And I hope that you reach out to me when the time comes. Like I said, call, text, email, leave me a message on my website, to thetwincities.com. DM me on Instagram, DM me on Facebook, whatever you gotta do, tie a little note to a pigeon, send it my way. Hopefully I get it because I really do look forward to meeting you. I look forward to walking you through this process. I look forward to showing you around the Twin Cities if you're not from here. I really love the whole process. I'm excited for you to meet the team and just kind of see this whole thing that we got going on. I appreciate you watching this video. Again, subscribe, like, and comment. Do the things. We did it. That was seriously, that took a very long time. That took, that took so long. Thank you for sticking with me. Love you. Bye-bye.